Um, how many of you sitting here right now, how many of you are familiar with this movie? I don't know if you see this, ever, anybody ever saw this movie? This movie, uh, the famous movie, The Wizard of Oz, right? This is uh, Dorothy, Judy Garland, uh, and uh, I'm sure that most everybody here has seen this classic movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz, and the most iconic quote from that movie, when Dorothy is standing there in front of the, the good witch, longing to get back to the family that loved her, um, and she kept repeating that line, right? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I, I think truer words could never be spoken, especially if you were brought up in a family that was a loving, wonderful, functional family. Uh, but when we lose the family, we all suffer. Everybody in society suffers. There are a myriad of social ills that we are dealing with in our society today, and there is an undeniable correlation between the problems that we face in our nation and the condition of our families. The, the whole bedrock that holds the society together, it's not the government, it's not found in our education system or in its wealth, although we have lots of that. The health of the nation is rooted in the home. And today our culture right now is suffering because of the disintegration of the family. We are operating uh, in a adverse way. We are not operating in God's way, the way he designed families to operate. Many of our social ills can be traced back specifically to the dysfunction and sometimes the complete disappearance of the family unit the way that God designed so today, a, a majority of uh, families are dysfunctional. You know, single-parent homes are, are, are a plethora. Divorce and remarriage or parenting with someone who you're not married to or people who are living in uh, a situation with no mother or father as orphans. Did you realize that one in three children in America today are growing up in America without a father in the home? That's 24 million kids without a dad. And we wonder, we ask ourselves, how can anything uh, good come out of that? Clearly, we are not embodying the concept of the family the way that God initially designed it as a nuclear family. But the passage that we're going to look at today, I think it lays out a simple roadmap back. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have a Bible, you can start turning that way. But you know, we're in this series, right? It's uh, the Ephesians series. And uh, last week we talked about that beautiful passage. And it is a beautiful, uplifting passage about the principles in marriage, where wives are called to be subject to their husbands, and husbands are called to love their wives like Christ loved the church, to have this unconditional uh, indelible love for their wives. But now he is turning to the kids. So let me read the first few verses. If you have the Bible, just pull, turn to it right now. It's Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, let me read it for you. First, uh, um, let, let's just read verse 1 there. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's pretty simple, pretty succinct. You probably have quoted it to your kids. <laughs> As children who belong to the Lord, it's saying there, who are in the Lord, we are to obey our parents. Seeing that your parents are actually instruments of the Lord, it's only right that you listen to them. Uh, in essence, if you're obeying your parents, then you're obeying the Lord. And that's really the, the reality of it. I think we failed to see the connection Parents actually have a very unique role to play in that they are representing God in their homes to their children. So if you're a loving parent, then you're giving an, a model of a loving God who is the Heavenly Father. It seems like um, some parents have lost their way when it comes to this issue. I wonder how parents have, uh, have relinquished this wonderful mandate here. Parents, um, I, I think they sometimes wonder whether they have the right to tell their children what to do. 
And um, I don't know if you notice this, but I see it all the time. I see parents reasoning with their kids. No, 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 Johnny. Uh, now, you shouldn't hit your sister, especially with that bat. It's not very nice. Would you please be nice? Would you please be nice? No, no, Johnny, you shouldn't run around in the store. Um, and, and so we have parents that are pleading with their children to comply instead of telling them this is the way it's going to be. And frankly, I don't care if you like it or not. I mean, pep. Parenting is not a popularity contest, right? We're not here to make friends with our, our, our kids, right? I don't care if you disagree. Now, that might sound kind of harsh, so maybe you could soften a little. Maybe the mothers can say, I'm sorry if you feel that way. But at the end, you have to say this, but rules are rules, and these are the rules. And uh, instead, what we do is we negotiate with our kids, or <laughs> very commonly, we bribe them to get them to do what we want them. Just do this and you'll get, yes, I'll give you 20 candy bars. Just stop screaming in the department store, please. You know, we'll do anything to get our kids to do what we want except to expect and, uh, and just, uh, we, I don't know. We as parents need to enforce this non-negotiable principle. We need to expect obedience from them. Uh, and you're doing no favor to your kid by pandering to them. Now, it goes on. It says, uh, not only that, but it says in verse 2, it says, Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And verse 3 says, so that it may be well with you, here's the promise, and that you may live long on the earth. Wow. So, here we have it today. We need to talk about the vision that God has for a healthy family. And he's addressing these children and he's giving them two commands. He's saying, children, number one, I want you to honor, I mean obey, and number two, I want you to honor. Obey and honor. Two simple words that you need to add to your vocabulary. Now, we've been talking about something we started to bring up over the last couple of weeks about this concept of submission. Submission is a, a fundamental concept in God's order and design for society. And this principle all really starts in the home. If children are not taught about submission to authority while they're growing up in their home, then we shouldn't really be surprised when we have a difficult time uh, getting them to submit to other authorities, such as their teachers or their boss or their police or to their husbands. They're going to bristle at it, right? This is where we instill the doctrine of submission as an ingrained principle for living. It's fundamental. And the reason God instituted this concept of submission is because there is blessing in submission. We think, I don't know, people have a perverted view. They think that they're losing something, that somehow they're going to be deprived of something that's good. But in reality, submission um, is, is a good thing. In submission, we're often being spared or protected from the things that are bad. Submission actually creates order, and submission helps people to avoid a, a myriad of undue heartache in their life. And those who re refuse to learn submission are going to experience a lot of heartache. They're going to experience broken relationships. They're going to suffer because of their inability to cooperate with those around them who can actually enrich their lives. Submission brings us peace. Do you know submission is a liberating thing? A lot of people think of submission like, I want the control, but it's a wonderful thing to let go of the control. It's actually quite a relief to place yourself under someone else's authority and not be saddled with the burden and the responsibility of making the hard decisions. When we submit to our parents, the Bible says, that we're promised a long life. See, submission is a good thing. It's a virtuous thing. It's a healthy thing. So the first command there is to obey. And it, it, it applies specifically to children who are what? Who are living under their parents' roof. Those children who are um, depending on their parents for support and financial assistance. So as long as you're living with your parents, even you 39-year-olds, 
You need to submit to your parents' rules in the house. If you cannot or you will not, uh, then I believe that those children, those adult children, should be politely shown the door. They have to be able to obey. Children are to obey as long as they want to live with their folks. So if you, some of you, you know, guys, you know, getting, you know, they got that nice basement, you know, man cave down there and your parents, anyway, listen, you got to obey, obey your parents if you want to live there. But anyway, I'm going to give you a little example of something though. Um, because it, it does hit on the cusp as kids right come to that time when they're starting to merge into adulthood. There once was a young girl who was 19. She was living in her home. She was quite rebellious. She was, because of her actions, cre creating a terrible strife for the family. And she wasn't the only kid in the house. There were four other siblings younger than her. And she thought, well, I'm older, and I should have a different set of rules than everyone else. She wanted to live there free free of charge, with all of the benefits, including mom's home cooking, but she didn't want to abide by any of the rules that were put down there. She can come and she can go, and she should be allowed to come and go as I please, right? I mean, I'm 19 years old. She wanted all of the freedom with none of the responsibility that comes with living in a family. And uh, obviously, this created tremendous conflict in a very negative influence on the rest of the children. So the parents got to that point where they had no other choice. They gave her a choice, an ultimatum. Either you abide by our rules and our curfew and everything else, or you have to leave. It's really simple. If you want to abide by our rules, you can stay here. But if you don't, then you have to leave. So she left. She left. She said, uh, okay, I'm leaving. Unfortunately, it wasn't what she thought it was. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, she faced many struggles for many years. Uh, she ended up getting pregnant, and um, she sacrificed a lot of things. She sacrificed intimacy and closeness with her parents and her siblings. She lost um, a lot of the joy that comes with being part of a family. She started to become very lonely, and she struggled for many, many years financially, and eventually, uh, uh, you know, things kind of slowly turned around, but about 30 years late, Lots of unnecessary heartache, all because she never learned the value of submission. So obey, it's not a hard thing. It's a liberating thing. It's a good thing. Uh, but we have one more command, and that command is something I want to focus on a lot more, and that's where it says to honor your father and your mother. This is a direct quote. It's uh, reiterating one of the Ten Commandments, right? The fourth commandment in the Old Testament says we are to honor our parents. So this admonition that they're giving here in Ephesians, it's a timeless principle. It's been around since creation. So lest any of you here are sitting here, right now you're sitting here thinking, this message does not apply to me. Nowhere does this command end. I know where does it say, once you get to this age, you can stop honoring your mother and father. We naturally apply this passage to the toddlers and the adolescents, and, and we make a quick note of it to the rebellious teenager, like we just talked about, right? But the call to honor our parents is, is really, it's a lifetime responsibility. Long past the years when you were under their roof, you should be honoring your parents as long as they live. So when you decide that you need your independence and you move out, you're in your 20s, or in some cases your 30s finally, and you're still supposed to honor them. When you get married and you start your own family and you start doing things on your own, you still need to honor them. When you get into your 40s and 50s and 60s and you have your plate full and, and your own kids start leaving the house and moving out and getting married, you still have to think about your parents and honor them. It never ends. So the next obvious question then is, well, what does that look like? How? How do I honor my mother and father? How does a child honor their mother and their father after they're out of the house? What does that look like? That word, honor, it means to respect. It means to value. In the Greek, it literally means to revere and to prize. So 
when you think about how you treat your parent, is when you treat them in the way that you do, do you think that it is as a highly valued, deeply prized, respected gift from God? Is that how you treat them? I think sometimes we tend to take our parents for granted. So I want to get really practical, okay? Because I think that this is a virtue that we need to raise the temperature on. And how is it that you can honor your parents? Maybe you need some advice on how you can do that and put that into practice. Now, if you're living under their roof, one way to honor them, the most obvious way, is you obey them. We already talked about that. But for the rest of us, you're growing, you're out of the house. Let me suggest six Yes, that's right. Six practical tenets for applying this principle. Very easy. The first one's easy. The first way you can honor your parents is talk to them. You'd think that that would be like natural and easy, but we sometimes get really disconnected. But when we communicate with our parents, we show them that we care about what is going on in their life. We care about what they think. And if we don't live with them, and we can't talk to them every day. How hard is it to call them on the phone or text them or, or stop by and visit them unexpectedly? I mean, is it really that hard to do that? Um, simple way to honor your mother and father. How about number two? Thank them. Have you ever thanked them? Let them know how much you appreciate them. As adults, have you ever affirmed your parents looking back and saying, Mom, Dad, I really want to thank you for what a good job you did in raising me. I'm, I'm really thankful for the things that you taught me. We, we, again, we take our parents for granted. Number three, how about this one? You would be so wise if you did this. The Bible tells us to do this. Ask them for advice. One way to honor your mother and father is to actually get input from them. There are so many times in my life that I ask my dad for his opinion and his advice because even if I didn't like the answer, because sometimes I didn't, he gave me advice. I said, Dad, what do you think about this? And he gave me advice. But I knew when he gave me advice, he gave me the best answer that he could because he loved me and he wanted what was best for me. So sometimes he would give me advice, and I thought he was way off track, and I didn't listen to him. And I was so, <laughs> I so much rem remember stories of, of looking back, and it's like, I'm so glad he didn't say, I told you so, because he could have. Uh, one time, I bought a, I, I had a car, and I sold it to a friend, but he didn't have all the money. And he says, I'll give you the money, Chuck, later. We'll give you a little bit every once in a while, and I'll get it to you. And he owed me about two grand, $2,000. And my dad says, don't give him the car until he gives you all the money. Then he can have the car. I said, no, Dad, he's a really good friend of mine, and he's a Christian. Certainly he's going to be good for it, Dad. And so he says, I wouldn't do that. I I'm telling you, Chuck. Wait till he gives you all the money, and then you give him the car. Oh, Dad, nah, I don't know. I'm just going to give it to him. So I gave it to him, and he gave me $100 the first month. And then he gave me $100 the second month. And now he gave me the down payment, and $200 more, he still held me about $1,000. And then he stopped giving me money. And I, I, he, then he didn't answer my calls. And then he wouldn't see me. He'd avoid me at church. Christian guy, right? My dad didn't say nothing. Finally, my dad says, you really need to do something about this. So I called the father. And I said, your son owes me, owes me for my car. So he came over with, with his son and gave me $500. And said, here, I'm paid up. He owes me 1000 I never got that last $500 to this day. To this day, I, my dad, he never said nothing, but I learned a valuable lesson. My dad was right. My dad was right. Okay, I got off track on that. It was just a fun story. You need to ask your parents what they think. I guarantee you they have things that they've learned in this life of theirs. Number four, give them your time. How much time do you have in a day? Don't get so busy that you have no time for the ones who raised you. They had time for you. 
They came to your baseball games. They came to your recitals. They made time to cook meals every day, drive you wherever you needed to go like a taxi service, show them that you love them and that you honor them by making time for them. I'm not saying you have to go to their house every single day. I'm saying make time for them. And you know what I'm talking about. And then, here's one last one. One last important one. Care for them. What do I mean, care for them? There's coming a time when you may need to care for your parents like they cared for you. There's some trends that we see. More people are living longer and more people are living past the age of 85. More people are living alone than ever before. And this is especially true because of the, the huge number of divorced people who never got remarried. Today, there are 40 million Americans over the age of 65. And 5.6 million are over the age of 85. That's a lot of old people. And they're all parents or were parents, right? A lot of them, right? And these numbers, they're only going to increase. In fact, dramatically. In the next 20 years, because of the aging baby boomers, who I don't know what group that is, that generation. But in the baby boomers, there's 75 million baby boomers moving into the ranks of the older senior population. So there's going to be a lot of old people that are going to be needing their love and care and support when they can't care for themselves anymore. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, Listen to your father who begot you. Do not despise your mother when she is old. We don't have time. Don't you know? I mean, I got a family to raise myself. And it's a sad commentary about our culture. But over the past few generations, we have less regard for our aging parents. And it's one of the casualties of the narcissistic, self-absorbed kind of mentality that we've been creating, where people only think about themselves, right? So God forbid that our mom and dad can no longer take care of themselves. I hope they don't get sick. Oh, man, if they get sick, it would just disrupt my life. So rather than step up and shoulder the responsibility, what do we do? We pass them off to somebody else. We pass them off to a facility because the facility can do such a good job. So there are millions of elderly people living in assisted living facilities, nursing homes. Some of them have extraordinary health problems. There is no other choice. I mean, I'm very sympathetic about this. Uh, but how many of these people that live in these situations could live and stay at home or live with their children? But because we're too busy, we can't. And, and again, there are many situations where this arrangement in retirement communities is the best way to care for our parents. And um, for some, living in a home is a wonderful option. Uh, because they're, they're in a place that's well run with a lot of older folks and they're being loved and treated with dignity. But that's not the case in a lot of places. I, I've been to them. I know firsthand, right? Um, let me give you an example of this one. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, because whether they live with you or whether they live in an assisted care facility, we still need to honor them. And we need to show their honor to them. And what happens is, is they get forgotten. Um, one day I, I went, visited a lady in our church at a nursing home nearby, not too far from here. We're sitting in the common area, talking to one another, just chit-chatting. And another lady comes over. She rolls her wheelchair over to our table, and she asked if she could visit with us. And we said, sure, come on over. And she came and sat with us. And we started to have a little conversation. I asked her to tell me a little bit about herself. How long have you been here? I've been here eight years. Wow, eight years. I asked her then this question, do you have a family? And she goes, yeah. She goes, I have a son and I have a daughter. Really? Oh, yeah. That's... And my husband passed away a few years ago. But I still have my two kids and a couple granddaughters. I asked her then, how often do you get to see them? And she said, well, I haven't seen my son in years. Well, how about your daughter? Well, I might see her once a year, maybe twice. Then I asked her this next question. I said, oh, that's really too bad. Well, where do they live? 
thinking they lived in Texas or something or Uganda. And she said, well, my daughter just lives down the street about less than a mile. And my son lives in Naperville, which is not that far. And I was just flabbergasted because I thought to myself, here's this sweet woman living in a home. And she was clearly very lonely, just looking for anybody to, to have a conversation with. Yet her own daughter cannot come by to visit here though she lived less than a mile away. And what happened in that home that she would forget about her mother? You see what we've done? We've gotten so busy with our lives that in some cases we have just discarded our parents. And uh, we rationalize our lack of involvement by saying we have enough problems of our own and, oh, I can't be bothered. Like, like a disposable razor, we discard our parents. And this is not everybody. You know, but uh, the people that changed our diapers, the people that raised us, gave us sorts, all sorts of opportunities for a better life. They, the ones that sacrificed so we could go to college, so we could pursue our dreams, who gave up some of their own pursuits for us. And then when they get older and they need us, if for nothing else, just for companionship, we forget about them. So honor your mother and honor your father. It's kind of a little bit of a spanking to our society. And, uh, but we need to talk to them. We need to thank them. We need to ask them for advice. We need to give them our time and care for them. But I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are sitting here and you're saying, well, I didn't grow up in a healthy family. For some people, they weren't brought up in a stable environment with two parents where everybody worked together like a team, like Little House on the Prairie, right? Some people you might have grown up in an abusive home. For some, you have huge, deep scars and emotional and physical abuse that you endured. Some of you might have grown up with absentee parents or a father who abandoned your family. And it would be nice to think that all the mothers and the fathers in the world love their children deeply and they're fulfilling their responsibilities to raise their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, right? But the reality is, is that doesn't happen in a lot of homes. And your home life was very painful for you. And you're sitting here going, this is a fantasy, Chuck. You know, they grew up in homes where their parents abdicated their responsibility to parent. They thought, well, I'll just leave it up to the schools and the government and, and the church. Yeah, that's it. The church can raise my kids. Just anything to give me a break. Go on, Johnny, go to Iwana. Just, don't even, just make sure... You give me a little bit of a break. How's that been working so far? Well, it hasn't. And the parents are complicit in this takeover by a secular worldview being foisted upon our children. So I have to ask this question as you really think about this. Just kind of force the issue. How do you honor a scoundrel? How do you honor a scoundrel? I'm talking about a deadbeat dad or a verbally abusive mother. What does that look like? All of a sudden, honoring your mother and father and your parent isn't so easy, is it? All of a sudden, that feels a little bit harder to do, doesn't it? So if this is your situation, perhaps I can make a few suggestions. First of all, the Bible doesn't say that honoring your parents is optional. If you look at the passage, these commands are not conditional. In other words, we are required to obey and honor our parents regardless of whether they deserve it or not. And that seems like a tall order if you've been hurt deeply by your parents. But we've been emphasizing now for weeks, for weeks, that God is calling us to this worthy walk, to this supernatural life, empowered by the Spirit. He wants us to respond like Christ would. And that is something that is much uh, higher than what is naturally expected. So everything that God has asked us to do, he says, I will give you the grace to perform it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So what he's saying there in this passage is, God has given you his grace and his power to enable you to honor your parents even though they're the last person on earth 
you would want to honor. God will give you his grace. Earlier in chapter 2, Paul said that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this, this fact that we are created, we are new creatures in Christ. We have been given the d- divine enablement of the Holy Spirit to perform this good work of honoring our mother and father, even though we don't feel like it. So by God's grace, we can do something that truly is difficult and honor the position that they have. And so here's my last way to honor your parents if you're in that situation, and that's this. Forgive them. Forgive them. We're going to mess up. I'm glad my kids haven't held things against me that I've done in my lifetime. I wasn't always a good parent. I didn't all, I sometimes blew it. I sometimes really put my foot in my mouth and said things that we all do as parents sooner or later because you know what? We're human. And I'm so glad that my kids showed grace to me and forgave me. And that's what we need to do. If you've been hurt by a, a parent in your life, one of the great ways that you can honor your parent, your mother or your father, is to forgive them. What does it say back in Ephesians? It says, be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. That includes your parents, even as God for Christ has forgiven you. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Maybe you felt persecuted by your parents. He says, forgive them. Love your enemies. This is what we're called to as believers in this elevated new position that we have in Christ. We have the empowerment and enablement to do that. And I'll tell you, it, it'll be so liberating. This will be such an honorable testimony to not only to the world when they, they see this love and forgiveness and this honor you show to your mother and father, but to your mother and father. You know, there's a verse, and I'll close with it. It talks in, in Peter about how women marry to unsaved husbands. How can they win them? It says, it says that you could win them without a word by your chaste and respectful behavior. That's how you can win an unsaved husband. Let's say you're a believer and they're not. You don't have to nag them to be saved. Just show them this unbelievable demonstration of a changed life. And they're going to want that. Maybe you could be the one to lead your parents to the Lord by the way you honor them even when they don't deserve it. That would be great, wouldn't it? I think that we need some some restoration going on in some homes. I don't know what's going on behind the walls of your houses. I don't know your history. I don't know your story. But I'm, I'm assuming, I suspect, some of you got some stories right? And God's saying, you know what? I can make all things new. I can. And there's reconciliation. God reconciled you, and he can reconcile your home and your, and your relationship with your mother and your father. You know, as we close, and we're going to have a word of prayer, I just want you to think that our heavenly father loved us so much that he sent Jesus down to this earth to die on a cross to pay the debt of of the penalty for your sins and mine. And he said, I love you so much that I'm going to endure the suffering and the pain so that you can be forgiven. And all I ask you to do is put your faith and trust in that. What a beautiful example of God's love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. And you can experience that today. If you've never trusted in Christ, that's what it's all about. Because the moment you trust in Christ, your life is going to be transformed. God will forgive you of your sins, and he will make you his own. He will make you his child, and he will give you eternal life, and you can never lose it, and he's got you. Secure in his palm, and right in the palm of his hand, he's holding you. Isn't that wonderful? If you've never trusted in Christ, you could do it today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that um, you've given us our parents. Whatever they were, Lord, they were the parents you gave us, Lord. Whether they were 
the perfect ideal parents or whether they were filled with flaws and imperfections. Lord, we just thank you for our parents because they helped us to be who we are today. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would learn to obey and honor our parents um, and that we would learn to um, really display this changed life in the way we treat them. Lord, I also pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here who's never trusted in you, that this would be the day when they would come to the terms with you, that they cannot come before a holy God because of their sin, and that the only way that they can have eternal life and be guaranteed a place in heaven is if they admit that they are lost, that they cannot save themselves, and put their faith and trust in Jesus alone. And I pray for that, Lord, that everybody here is trusting in you for their salvation. Because there is no other way. In Jesus' name.